Ma di sicuro stai impattando con, con l'acqua alta, come è successo a novembre. E... Ma in generale un sacco di plastica ovunque. Anche nei canali, quando si passa in barca, ce n'è sempre di più, soprattutto adesso d'estate che stanno tornando i turisti. È stato bello durante la quarantena perché ad esempio si notava con l'acqua che era molto più pulita e senza il matondoso. Si sa bene, poi è abitudine delle cose, in tutte le cose è un'abitudine. Mm. Sia nel caldo, nel freddo, con l'acqua alta, è, è tutta un'abitudine. Siamo stati colpiti anche da un'inondazione molto grande, però come sempre i veneziani noi che ormai siamo nati con l'acqua alta, viviamo, ci conviviamo, abbiamo passato anche quel scoglio e sopportiamo tutto su un cambio climatico. Qui il problema grosso è solo la burocrazia. If we want to see positive things about the virus, uh, we saw that uh, in like two, three months uh, the nature take uh, its spaces back. <laughs> so water is more clear, is you see birds living eggs all around, uh, even ducks here. For me important is also this Friday for Fridays for Future uh, because during the lockdown the skies were clear and no, no, no planes and the, uh, the, the, the air was breathable. Per quanto riguarda l'aeronautica la, ieri in particolare, gli studi vanno sia sulla struttura dell'aereo ma soprattutto sulla motorizzazione, quindi fare motori sempre più efficienti a basso impatto ambientale. Le Covid è la migliore soluzione per che gli animali aiutino meglio, che gli aiutino di polluzione. Il y a des solutions, mais les gens justement qui roulent en voiture ne veulent pas changer leur perception de la vie. Et tant que les gens ils ne regarderont pas plus de vent, ça changera pas. We are talking about climate as a crisis for how long? Maybe 30 years, maybe even more. When you are trying to uh, deal with uh, the climate crisis in a proactive way, I think like green tourism or uh, the debate how we can um, cooperate across borders. Uh, to uh, be more, uh, uh, you know, to be more sustainable. There we are uh, giving a huge aid of 8,000 euros uh, for those who want to buy a new electric car, for example. So this is like a very concrete example that we don't want to give out just money like that, but we link it to uh, ecological uh, criteria. Justement, rester local. Mais alors, quand je dis ça, surtout pas se renfermer. Ça veut pas dire qu'il y aura pas de transport uh, de. de de grands transports ou quoi, mais au maximum rester local. Il y a, il y a deux populations. La, la population qui a encore un pouvoir d'achat euh, assez conséquent euh, veut vraiment se tourner vers encore plus de local. Et donc ce sont des produits euh, avec, euh, qui, qui sont un peu, un peu plus chers, hein, forcément, puisqu'ils sont produits ici localement. Et on a la deuxième partie de la population qui, elle, n'a toujours pas et peut-être a même perdu du pouvoir d'achat qui, elle, cherchera toujours les prix et euh, toujours voilà, le moins cher de chez moins cher de chez moins cher. Nous, comme êtres humains, sommes puissants, intelligents, spécieux, et puis, à la même temps, nous devons aussi remercier que nous ne sommes pas les seuls qui ont le droit de vivre sur la planète. Et ça m'a fait me tourner végétarien. Les petites choses, comme si nous n'avons pas de pêches et nous n'avons pas de birds, et que nous n'avons pas de pêches, je vois i see the small things which concern me personally. I cannot care so much for the big, which are, of course, more important and, let's say, more dramatic. Welcome to um, this panel today on Europe's Green uh, Deal, the, uh, the Europe's Growth Strategy, uh, which is uh, uh, consisting today of a keynote speech by Franz Timmermans, Vice President, Executive Vice President of the European Commission in charge of the Green Deal. He will present and share his thinking um, on the Green Deal and how the Green Deal can or cannot be a growth strategy, uh, and I think we will debate afterwards um, how much of a growth strategy is, uh, is it, how much is it um, 
just a necessity to mitigate climate change and how much of an opportunity but how much of a threat also for inequality um, is this Green Deal. But before uh, we come to the debate, um, I very much uh, look forward to um, the speech by uh, the executive vice president, who is actually with us here in Brussels. So it's actually the first event um, of, the, of the day where we are all here in our studio um, in our Brussels headquarters at, at Bruegel. Um, and um, after the speech of Mr. Timmermans, um, my uh, colleague Maria de Merzes, Bruegel's deputy director, and myself, will debate uh, with him and also take some questions from you, uh, the online audience. Please go on Slido um, and type in uh, the hashtag BAM, Bruegel Annual Meeting, BAM20, um, and then just ask your question, and we will try to take some of your questions uh, and bring them to the attention of, of Mr. Timmermans. So thank you for uh, joining um, this um, uh, debate. Um, I hope you um, enjoyed a bit the video that was produced by uh, Giuseppe Porcaro that was shown just before the start of this panel. Um, and uh, welcome to you, Mr. Timmermans. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, hello to everyone, wherever you are. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you about the Green Deal today. Uh, and as you know, uh, it's only been 10 months since we presented the European Green Deal. Uh, it was our transformative agenda to combine policies to tackle climate change, to reverse biodiversity loss, and to eliminate pollution by moving to a circular economy. Uh, but it's more than that. The Green Deal is Europe's new growth strategy. It's a strategy where environmental, economic, and so social sustainability go hand in hand. And because for too long, they didn't go hand in hand. For too long, different policies to boost sustainability had been uncoordinated or worse, at odds uh, with each other. And after working on this for quite some time now, my main conclusion is that um, the Green Deal will be social or it will not happen. So that's why we're trying to bring it all together now. When we first presented the Green Deal, we seemed to be in, uh, in a good position. The financial crisis had faded into the past. Fears about the economic pillars of our union, a single market, a common currency, had receded into the background, and macroeconomic numbers had turned positive again. We had the highest level of employment ever in European history. Uh, but you just had to scratch the surface to discover what still lingered below. An untenable economic model relying on the ever-increasing use of a dwindling set of resources. Social injustices created by previous crises. Failure to distribute the benefits of our growth fairly. Insecurities due to disruptive technological change and existential challenges posed by climate change. Just below the surface, an undertow of fear, loss, disruption and even outright decline had been swelling. It's a toxic cocktail that permeates our societies and our politics at all levels. Left unchallenged, such an undertow could become a tidal wave ready to swallow all. And I have to say, in some places, this has already uh, begun. From the outset, the overriding priority of this commission has been to help navigate our continent and everyone living on it through these tumultuous times to respond to the calls for change coming from our voters, our businesses, our scientists, our children. The European Green Deal was a big part of the solution. It was an effort to provide certainty amidst all this turbulence and uh, to, to dare to reimagine our future. The Green Deal was our claim to a different destiny, a more inclusive, greener, and overall stronger society. It still is. As I said, we are now 10 months into the Green Deal. We're putting our political commitment to climate neutrality into law. We're setting out how we will build our new future, whether it regards energy industry, farming, food, biodiversity. And soon, very soon, we will propose a new emissions reduction target for 2030. We will raise our ambition and we'll support it with the necessary policy actions and legal changes. This autumn, we will share our proposals on how to trigger a renovation wave across Europe to improve energy efficiency and ensure green jobs close to home. 
Our upcoming offshore energy strategy will help create required increase renewable energy. By June next year, we will also propose revisions to our legal framework for climate and energy. Uh, so our enhanced ambitions covering everything from the emissions trading system to new CO2 emission standards for cars and vans. And we will proceed with a carbon border adjustment mechanism so we can uphold the promise made in Paris without having to pay undue economic costs if international partners to not, do not show enough ambition, if they simply do not do what they promised to do in Paris. We will do it. And if we need to protect our industry and we need to protect our citizens against the inactions of others, we will certainly do that. They're all measures we had planned from the beginning. But to use a, a massive understatement, 2020 has not been what we were planning for. <laughs> Ten months ago, who was expecting the global health crisis that burst onto the scene a mere three months later? A crisis of such proportions that our immediate priorities had to change overnight as we reacted to the virus and its effects on our economies. We put out the Green Deal to change the direction of growth in the long term, but the virus turned growth negative in the shortest of terms. We proposed the climate law to give European industries and investors predictability, but the virus enveloped them in the thickest of fogs. We set a course to make Europe the first climate neutral continent, but the virus has thrown the world as we knew it off course. It would have been easy and maybe even understandable to just drop everything on the spot throw our green ambitions out the window. For who has time to think about what the planet needs 10 years from now when loved ones are ill? Or when you have to worry if you still have a job next week? People's priorities have changed. And as uncertainty grows, so does the pressure on governments to provide quick fixes. Yet, here we are, not just maintaining our ambitions, but doubling down on the Green Deal. It was our growth strategy, and now it is also our roadmap out of this crisis, a lifeline to a better future. We're in a very different place today from where we were and from where we expected to be, but the simple fact is that the Green Deal made sense then, and it makes even more sense now. I would like to provide you with three reasons why. First, the climate and environmental crisis is still very much upon us. While we fight the health and economic crises that have taken over our daily lives, we cannot forget that the climate crisis already has one foot in the door. The cost of climate action may seem high, but it is dwarfed by the cost of inaction. It makes sense to avoid that bill and to improve our lives in the meantime. We can do both. Second, the European Union will be spending 1.8 trillion to help reboot the economy, an unprecedented amount of resources that will be used in unprecedented ways. European leaders agreed last July that 30% should be spent in support of our climate objectives. That's a huge step. It makes sense, but it's still a huge step. There is no going back to business as usual. Even the strictest penny pinchers will admit that by now. It's just bad economics. Why spend money to keep things as they are when you know you'll require money again to change them in the near future? I think this is also something that has been part and parcel of thinking in the financial world over the last couple of months. It would be wasteful and even irresponsible as new money might no longer be available in a world burdened with post-COVID debt and we will have billions and billions of stranded assets. And the money we use now is money borrowed from next generations. Spending it on their future instead of our past is a moral imperative and a matter of economic good sense. We have no choice. We have to borrow. We have to spend this money now. But I want us to do it in a way that makes us responsible in the eyes of our children, that makes us accountable to them in terms of what we achieve with this money. Finally, to overcome the COVID crisis, we need expansionary macroeconomic policies. Green Deal investment will offer a double dividend. The investments needed for the transition are the same kind of investments that are needed for the recovery. So why choose one if you can have both? Several of them are easy to get going and will have a high impact on employment and the rest of the economy. 
think of energy efficiency renovation in buildings. Others offer strong prospects for current and future global industrial leadership, like offshore energy and the hydrogen economy. Of course, money will be spent on the immediate priorities of the crisis as well. But we must avoid the trap we fell into after the financial crisis. Yes, we absolutely have to protect incomes and jobs. And yes, we absolutely have to make sure the current crises do not permanently widen injustices within our societies. But what we absolutely should not do is equate income and job protection with the blind preservation of sources of income and employment that we know, we know, have no future. Then you're wasting money and you're wasting people's time, by the way. And we cannot win our fight for greater fairness, for a just transition, if we defend an economic model that delivered growing inequalities on the back of, of a dwindling set of resources. No can we get to a fairer world if we hit pause and let climate change run its course. We see the effects on a daily basis, and we've also seen them this summer. The climate transition, of course, has distributional effects that we need to keep a watchful eye on when we design our policies. But we cannot forget that the greatest number of losers would come from unchecked climate change, raining its misery on the least resourced countries and the poorest of our people. Let me now conclude by addressing the two most common objections to our Green Deal agenda in times of COVID. One is that the massive mobilization of public funds for the recovery and transition has indeed never been seen uh, before and will never be seen again. That is not a sustainable model. And that ultimately we will again face one of the fundamental challenges of the Green Deal, how to ensure enough private funds are mobilized for the transformation of our economy. I understand that criticism. I understand it. But we need a structural shift and it can only happen if private financial flows are redirected towards green assets and sustainable business models. This is a matter of redistribution. Like in any industrial revolution, like in any tectonic change in human history, at the end of the day, the issue of redistribution will be on the table. And in democracies that have the pretense to act for the common good, the most large, the largest possible definition of the common good, redistribution on the basis of solidarity becomes imperative and it needs to happen now as well. Finance used to be the problem, but in the 2020 crises, finance can help us find a solution if it takes steps to move away from brown investment. It is why our sustainable finance agenda, spearheaded by Valdes Dombrovskis, is such an important part of the Green Deal. It boosts the durable mobilization of private funds in support of our transition to climate neutrality. Our top priority in the agenda has been to end greenwashing. Thanks to the EU taxonomy, by the end of the year, we will, for the first time, have clear criteria that determine which economic activities truly help achieve our climate goals. Savers will be directly asked for their sustainability preferences. This means that everyone with a bank account can directly drive change. And I'm convinced that more and more Europeans will want their money to contribute to building a better future. And this takes me to the second common objection to our agenda. Because some will say, sure, continue with your plans, but this is not the time for more ambition. I tell them, it is exactly the time for more ambition. As you know, the Commission will present a new greenhouse gas emission reduction target for 2030 in the coming weeks. For obvious reasons, I cannot yet provide too many details. Nevertheless, if one thing stands out from the underlying assessment, it is that an increased target in the range of 50 to 55 percent is doable and that it can underpin sustainable economic growth. So increasing our ambition, especially now, makes sense. First, we do not have time to waste. Reaching climate neutrality by 2050 will require EU action in all sectors. The lead times in sectors like land use and transport are long, and they require that we step up action already over the coming decade. It's a matter of providing certainty and investment security. That's what the market and investors are asking for. Secondly, holding off now because we cannot afford it for the moment, is the surest way to not being able to afford it in the future either. Because with climate change, we do not choose the time horizon. We cannot stop the clock 
on climate change. We have no choice but to act now. We need to act now, we need to develop new technologies and ensure that costs come down within a time frame where we can still benefit from them. Shine, sign shows that tipping points are getting nearer the longer we wait. We should move now that we still have the freedom to choose. We can choose how we move. If we wait any longer, choices will be forced upon us and these choices will be far more painful and far more unjust on humanity. Similarly, we need to invest now to ensure a smoother transition for our business and citizens in, into the future when the carbon price will be higher. When that is the case, we need to have the infrastructure in place to allow people to switch to electric cars. And we should not wait for heating bills to rise before we start the renovations to make our houses energy efficient. This is so important for the fairness of the transition and for its political feasibility in the medium term that it should be a no-brainer for any leader. We can leave no one behind. Providing clarity in a moment where so much seems uncertain is therefore crucial. It is, if there is uncertainty about the future direction of our policies, businesses will simply wait and not invest. In today's economy, that would harm us twice because we need more private investment and we need them to flow towards a green transition and we need that to happen now. In conclusion, our response to the COVID-19 crises gives us the opportunity to save jobs, not for years, but for decades to come, and create new jobs. We may never again spend as much to reboot our economy, and I sure hope we will never again have to. Yet the debt we're loading on the shoulders of our children and grandchildren makes it even more necessary to ensure we provide them with a better future, a better future, a cleaner future, a healthier future, a fairer future. So we must stand firm and get this right from the start. As pressure grows, we must continue to resist the temptation to throw money at a carbon economy that will soon peter out. Backsliding into business as usual because it is faster, it's easier, and it, it's what we know just isn't an option. Of course, it's more difficult to do something we don't know yet. But it would be wrong and it would be a disservice to next generations if we just did what we knew out of convenience. As money begins to flow, governments, businesses and other players must resist the temptation to profit from the recovery effort by greenwashing policies and by pursuing projects that do not contribute to these goals. They must avoid creating stranded assets. And as time goes by, we should resist the temptation to focus exclusively on short-term recovery efforts, even if they are green and neglect to invest in the technologies and models that are necessary for a long-term transformation. We should do both. Quick results, but also the long-term, should keep. Uh, we should keep an eye on that. We have it in us to succeed. We have the money, we have the brain power, we have the commitment. And I hope even in the midst of this pandemic, because the confrontation with a completely unknown virus has ushered in a newfound respect for science and fact-based policymaking, because after an initial resurgence of borders and ugly nationalism, Europeans rediscovered that we are strongest together. And finally, just as with climate change, the pandemic underlies, underlines that no matter how much we are part of the cause, we're also providing that we can be part of the solution as well. As we work to overcome COVID-19, I'm convinced that the path to a brighter future to an inclusive, greener and stronger society is right in front of us. It requires us all to think beyond the immediate horizon and to avoid the reflex to restore what was and to make what needs to be made. With the European Green Deal to guide our way, I'm sure we can get there. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed, um, Mr. Mr. Timmermans, uh, it's, uh, I think, been a very, very clear uh, speech um, with um, a lot of ambition, I have to say. And I think it's um, I think many that uh, are worried about uh, climate change will be extremely delighted to hear that um, you have increased uh, the ambitions and you want to increase the climate ambitions um, in Europe. And um, arguably, uh, given where we are and how uh, the climate change uh, is accelerating globally, and we are not in a medium scenario, but increasingly in the worst case scenario. I think the case for strong action certainly is very big. 
Um, before I give the floor to, to Maria for, for a question, let me, let me ask, you and, uh, ask you one question myself, which is really um, uh, to, to enlarge a bit more on this issue of how um, the Green Deal is a growth strategy. Because um, I, mean, I think what we are saying here in this room sounds, sounds excellent, and it sounds excellent in Brussels, but when you are about to lose your job um, and you are, I don't know, somewhere in, let's say, Portugal, you're about to lose your job. I mean, how is, how is this strategy that you're proposing, um, how is that really going to help um, the person that is about to lose uh, his or her job? I mean, yes, medium term, we need to go there. I understand that. But isn't the main priority now to boost short term, short -term growth? And how can you with this strategy really help those that are in, in Portugal or, or elsewhere and that have just lost their job? How can you help them really to find a job? Well, it depends on, on, on the industries and you have to look, that's why we at the Commission, we, we di dive deeply into all the, the industries to understand the underlying issues. It depends on the industry. If you, if you throw money at a job, um, knowing full well that that job will be gone three or four or five years down the road, you create an illusion and you, you lose a lot of money uh, because these assets will be stranded and this is very often public money. So you have to, you know, where before the pandemic, we still had sort of a choice. We start reforming now or we can still wait a couple of years because the economy is doing well, etc. That choice has been taken away from us. Now we have to make very, very, very deep, um, uh, far-reaching and deep choices in terms of where we invest. And you see this way of thinking going on in almost every industry. Where do we need to restructure? What has, f has a future? What needs to be um, uh, restructured in a way uh, that we can survive as an industry? And we, as a, at the Commission, want to be part of this and to create job opportunities that are sustainable, that will still be there five, ten years from now, twenty years from now. And, and then I think there is a, a huge need of honesty uh, uh, in the public uh, debate. And I'm a politician. I know exactly what's going to happen in the next couple of months when unemployment starts to bite and when support programs run out. Then for a politician, it's very tempting to start throwing money at anything just to keep people in their jobs. But I hope that through the recovery plans that member states will have to make, coordinated at the European level, we can show the way ahead where investment actually leads to a sustainable economy, a circular economy, a future-oriented economy. And you can take any number of industries as an example. Take the car industry, for instance, as an example. Everybody will understand it needs to be restructured. Mario? Uh, thank you very much, Vice President. May I, may I also uh, ponder on this, on this point that Guntram is driving, what will it take? To get there, I think, because I think uh, m most of our most of us really need to know and understand what it will take. Thank you very much for your impassionate presentation of the cause, uh, and I really see that our public is really, you know, the rain the rain of comments that is coming in. I wanted to ask exactly that question on on, on the communication side. Uh, last year at Bruegel, we produced a graph in which we showed that CO2 emissions in European production has come down, it's stabilized and it's coming down, which is very much in line with what public opinion in Europe says, we want to do something about this. However, next to this graph, we also plotted the CO2 emissions of our consumption, and that was not going in the same direction. So effectively, what it tells us this graph is that we have exported industries that are not in line with our ambitions on the climate. Um, you know, is this, is this the future? That cannot be the future. And, you know, have we communicated clearly to the average consumer, to the person who's about to lose their job, to anybody, what it will take to actually be consistent with the ambitions that you have carefully underlined? Well, I think there is need uh, to have this conversation in a very honest way. Uh, because we, we are faced with a, a climate crisis that is an existential crisis. You know, our planet will survive the climate crisis. But will we as humanity? It depends on our choices. This planet has been able to exist without human beings for millennia, and it will exist without human beings for millennia if we, if we don't take care of ourselves and our planet. So there's this, the existential crisis, that will not go away and will continue to increase, and people see it. 
they see the forest fires, they see the storms, they see the heat, they see the drought everywhere in Europe. People see what's happening. But apart from that, it, that's not the only problem we face. We also are in the middle of an industrial revolution that even without the climate crisis, our industries will be changed fundamentally in the years to come. And so, and apart from that, there's also hugely uh, changing global relations. Europe is no longer, you know, dictating the music for the rest of the world. That's a thing of the past. And there are new players in, in the world that also claim a place, and there are emerging economies, and we all have to redefine these relations as well. So I think any politician who would say to people, just sit tight where you are and things will stay the same, you know, I'm, I'm very much on Tancredi's line. If we want things to stay the same, things will have to change. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is an argument we will have to take to the people. But I say immediately, uh, in, in line with this, if we do not combine that with a credible policy of showing that we will leave no one behind, people will resist the change anyway, even if they know it is necessary because they don't believe they will be part of the positive side of the change. They will only see the loss to them, and then they will resist that change. And we've seen a lot of that in the last 20 years in Europe. Mm -hmm. you know, if if, if the, the intrinsic feeling in the population is, whatever changes, I will lose, then you will resist any form of change. So we will have to demonstrate credibly that change is good for everyone, and that we we'll, we'll leave no one behind. It can be done, but I have to admit it's going to be terribly complicated and we need to make sure our efforts in Europe all point in the same direction and not member states going off in all sorts of different directions. Well, can I, can I push you perhaps on, uh, on one point which uh, I think is, is, um, is really uh, turning targets into action? Um, you talked a lot about the targets. I think we in this town have talked in the last 12 months certainly a lot about high targets. But I've seen less clear spelling out of how to achieve those targets. Um, I mean, most economists, and I'm one of those, um, think basically to achieve these climate targets, the most efficient way to do so is imposing a CO2 tax on all emissions and then let the market decide where to, where to save, uh, where the, the safest is cheapest, um, the saving of, of CO2 emissions is cheapest. And then perhaps, you know, support, of course, basic research and development, uh, uh, perhaps support some industrial policy in that space. I haven't seen yet uh, a clear announcement of, you know, what do we do? We have the emission tra uh, uh, trading system, the emission uh, trading system, ETS system, but we don't yet have on the other half of the emissions any, uh, I mean, European-wide or clear guidance on, on the prices. And the prices still are quite low. So, so, And there's a lot of uncertainty. And when I talk to business people, they tell me, well, I mean, Yes, we have all these ambitions. We know that these ambitions are coming and rolling at us, but we don't know yet how it's going to happen, what's going to happen, and so I hold back my investment, which is also really a problem for, for growth, right? Because uncertainty uh, hampers growth. So, so I would love to hear from you a little bit more on what's the concrete agenda. How do we actually achieve these targets? Well, first of all, I'm more optimistic about the emissions trading system as you seem to be. Um, initially in the, in the pandemic, the price just plummeted, and then in the pandemic, the price picked up again and is higher than before the pandemic now. So there is a belief in the market that this is a system that could work. What we need to do is expand the system. What we need to do is limit the, the, the free allowances in the system. What we need to do is spread it internationally to make sure that others take part as well. But I, I truly believe in the ETS as one of the main instruments to get us into that direction. Then, of course, we will have to introduce clear measures, and we have announced them and sometimes even proposed them already. We need we need to have the pesticides we use in agriculture. We need to improve the protection of biodiversity uh, with concrete measures. We need to reduce the emissions of cars to 50%, even beyond what we've done now. Um, we need to transform our energy mix and, and make sure we, we, we rely more on, on sustainable energy. We need to 
increase uh, the performance of the built environment. That's why we come with our renovation wave, and we can have concrete targets for that. We need to green our cities. We need to green our public transport. And all these things come with concrete targets uh, that will be part of the legislation we, uh, we, we propose. We need to look at our fiscal systems. As, you, as an economist, you will agree with me that to influence the behavior of people, fiscal systems are ideal. And, and you know, the, the limited natural resources we have are, are still not seen uh, by many economists as a production factor like labor and capital. But once you see it as a production factor, you can use the taxation system to make sure that this production factor is taken into due account. So we, there are uh, quite a number of things uh, we can do. We can also uh, you know, put a tax on uh, uh, not being renewable, uh, put a tax on using plastics that are thrown away, um, uh, legislate so that you have less single-use plastics, etc., etc. We can, in the, in the chemical world, we can also, because the chemical industry is now very much on board in trying to help us to get where we need to be, and also through legislation we can organize that. So there's many things uh, we can do, but the one thing that we really need is behavioral change, which we can influence by policies, but which will mostly be influenced if people see the urgency of what we need to do. Mm. And in fact, if I may, we have a concrete tool now, the next generation EU package, and there is uh, Andy Jobst from the IMF uh, is asking, um, how can uh, the funding from the Next Generation EU package be aligned with national energy and climate plans and the objectives of the Green Deal? Well, member states have, have um, um, promised to give us their recovery plans. Uh, and I think it is the Commission's essential task to make sure that these recovery plans are coordinated so that they all point into mm. the same direction. Uh, the one risk I see is that recovery plans become contradictory. Hmm. and then the money will be lost. We need the European scale to have recovery plans that are in sync with each other and with the European recovery plan. And I think our role as Commission is to make sure that this happens. And I think we need to be, you know, this is also a role of the Commission. It's not, we don't need to try and become popular with national governments. We need to be strict with national governments on this. And we need to sort of tell them exactly which plans go into the direction of a sustainable recovery and which plans don't. And this is going to be, I think, at some point also lead to quite tough discussions with national governments, but that's the only way forward. It, again, I repeat, if the national plans go in different directions, then the net effect of all of this yeah. will be suboptimal, to say the least, and will probably be contradictory with the, in contradiction with the uh, goals we want to attain. Indeed. Well, many governments uh, across Europe have already thrown a lot of money at what I guess you would call old industries or industries that basically have a limited future, such as the airline industry. And so I, I of course, would welcome if you, if you commented on, on, on your take on you know, the, the bailouts that have happened so far. I mean, we, we've put a, a lot of money into industries where you would say, well, is that really the industry that in 10 years, 15 years down the road uh, we think has, has a future? Well, you, you mentioned the airline industry, and I absolutely see a future for the airline industry. Uh, air transport will be necessary, but it has to become sustainable air transport. So we have to, and that's that's where you know I I'm, I'm very sorry that that for instance the budgets for for Horizon uh, Europe were limited or for R and D mm. were limited because we will need to speed up the development of uh, for instance uh, 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 synthetic fuels. Uh, or, or biofuels. We will need to speed up the development of new technologies, battery technologies, hydrogen technologies, and then and then you can transform uh, the way airlines operate. You can transform air transport. Well, we'll need it for the global economy and for the transport needs of people. But it will have to change. And and I think I think this by now there's probably no one in the airline industry who believe that the money they got is free money uh, and that they don't need to change. I think the the understanding in the airline industry that both because of the changing, and I think structurally changing behavior of, of people, and uh, the need for them to decrease their carbon footprint, there will have to be structural changes there as well. Mm. But we will continue to need an airline industry. Can I push a bit on the technology aspects? Yes. And sorry, Maria, uh, uh, I mean, uh, be because I mean, there is, um, I mean, there's always the question, to what extent can you as commission, as policymaker, decide on the technology of the future and to what extent do we leave that choice to to the markets, to the innovators, um, 
by just setting uh, setting basically the signal, giving the incentives. But then the way it's done, it's really it's really up to up to private actors. And I noted um, in in the recent documents quite a lot of emphasis on hydrogen. Um, there's a lot of debate on hydrogen as a carrier of energy, um, clean hydrogen, ideally produced with wind energy. I noted a bit less on solar. That, that's at least my impression. And I, I was just wondering, is there a sort of a clear strategy now to go in, in one direction, not the other? Or is it still a fairly wide open field, um, which you know really leaves the race open as, as regards the technologies that, that we need and, and basically just provides the funding for uh, some of the um, innovation, for the research and so on? But without really picking the winners already. Well, I think I think it's 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 logical that as Europeans we would look at the things where we have a, 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 an edge, a comparative advantage, where we already are ahead, and where we expect to be even further <coughs> ahead. And hydrogen is one of those areas. That's why you know in in, in record time, because there was hardly anything there when I came uh, in this job. In record time, we developed a hydrogen strategy at the European Commission, which, by the way, was very much welcomed by everyone in the market, and hydrogen is now becoming a very, very fast uh, uh, an idea that many people jump on. It used to be something that lived very much in, in, in Germany, in the Netherlands, and now exactly. you see if you look at Spain, Portugal, Italy, it's becoming something that's become really pan-European. And if we, if we invest in this and concentrate on this, we will be the world leaders in this technology, and it has so many advantages because you mentioned uh, we have huge potential in, in wind energy, especially offshore wind. It's taking off like a rocket right now. And if you could produce cheap hydrogen offshore with wind energy, you have a, an incredibly good energy source, but also it is the best possible storage of energy, which you can transport over long distances. Mm -mm. You cannot transport electricity that's created by wind over very, very long distances. But with already adapting already existing infrastructure for natural gas to hydrogen, you could hmm. create a number of winners across the European continent and also with our neighborhood to the east and our neighborhood to the south. So I believe hydrogen is fast becoming a very strong strategic asset, which, is, which has the added value of being climate uh, friendly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, if I make it uh, divert a little bit um, and take perhaps the, the Green Deal in a sort of more global context. We have a question here from Daniel Taras who's asking the Green Deal, what does it mean for the developing world? I think that's a very important question, but can I add to that perhaps the global context? Uh, you know, how can you ensure that you produce a, a Green Deal that, is, that is, makes Europe achieve its own targets but stay competitive in a, in a whole world in a global environment that is not necessarily cooperative? Does this pose a, a risk to the ambitions of the, uh, of the EU? And, and, you know, how do you plan to sort of ensure that the whole world is on board in an, uh, effectively a global public good? Well, let me, in fact, these are two questions. Let me yeah. start with the second, second one first. I remember, I'm old enough to remember, when, when Delors came with Europe 92, uh, people were saying, oh, that's going to be expensive, and Europe is not going to be competitive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but because we did it at the European scale, and everybody wanted to be on the internal market, it was uh, standard setting for the rest of the world. And I honestly believe exactly the same thing is going to happen in this area. Mm. If we are coherent as Europeans, and we set the standards for Europe as a whole, the rest of the world will want to be on our market, on our conditions, with our criteria. I strongly believe in this. Also because the rest of the world, the big economic players in the world, uh, uh, you, know, even l you have to look beyond the short-term political um, games that are being played. The rest of the world understands that we need to move in that direction. It's in their interest as well. So I am, in the midterm, optimistic about this standard setting, if we do the standard setting right in Europe, then the rest of the world will follow. We saw it on GDPR, on, on the protection of, of our, our private uh, hmm. uh, information, and we will see it in this area as well. We saw it in the internal market before. I'm fairly optimistic about it. Now, your, your first question on the developing world. It's not been that long ago that uh, in many parts of the developing world, two feelings were dominant. First of all, uh, environmental policy is a luxury for rich people. And secondly, we feel completely abandoned uh, by the uh, rich world that's only taking care of itself. Now, first of all, the first point has disappeared completely because what's happening 
uh, in the world in terms of erratic weather, in terms of droughts, in terms of storms, in terms of completely unpredictable weather patterns, in terms of, you know, look at the, at the, at the locust plague in Eastern Africa, etc. All these things are climate related and countries know this. Yeah. So the sense of urgency has highly increased globally. And especially the poorest countries in the world will suffer the most if they cannot adapt to this, mitigate the consequences, and be part of the development towards what I would call a Green Deal. I see the top priority for Europe and Africa. These are two, our sister continent, Africa, its fate is intimately linked to ours. If Africa doesn't get out of this well, we will not. If we don't get out of this well, Afri uh, Africa will also suffer more. And I honestly believe I have seen a true change in the attitude of African leaders on this. Not that they're saying, tell us what to do. They know exactly what they want to do, but in saying we want a partnership with Europe to see how we can electrify our continent, bring energy everywhere in a sustainable way. And by the way, the interesting thing is that sustainable electri electricity generation is much easier to do decent in a decentralized way in remote areas than bringing the, 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 the classical grids to those areas. So we have huge opportunities to help this young continent develop this. At the same time, we have to show solidarity that we help African countries mitigate the consequences of climate change and adapt to new weather patterns, et cetera, et cetera. If we do these things, if we are serious about this, I see a huge potential partnership. And I mentioned um, uh, hydrogen before. Just imagine the potential of hydrogen generated by wind or solar power in areas of Africa where not much grows, but there is a lot of sun and a lot of wind. Just imagine that if we establish a partnership on that. It will bring development to Africa and it will create global markets that Africa can be uh, part of. Well, we are getting a lot of questions from the audience already and uh, perhaps addressed to, to our audience. Um, if, if you uh, think a question is particularly relevant, please vote it up uh, so that it appears on the top of my news feed. Uh, that's always helpful because I can't read 33 questions <laughs> right, uh, right here and ask them to, to Mr. Timmermans. Um, and uh, perhaps as a quick remark, if I may, on the, on the development issue, I mean, I totally see the point that we can produce hydrogen in, uh, in, in Africa, how much it contributes to development. I think that's quite an open question because it's a very capital intensive industry that you plant into, into the desert and with relatively little human capital, uh, local human capital that's gonna be needed. So, so the value is uh, gonna be mostly related to the capital. So I'm not quite sure how much it really contributes to, to development in Africa which doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it, but I, 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 I mean, that's perhaps just a, a short comment. But, but let me uh, bring in a, a question here, two questions actually. One question from Jose Navarro. Um, he's asking, uh, private investments respond to incentives set by money at land area, but not rural jobs or the environment. How can this be made compatible, uh, uh, sorry, private investment mm -hmm. response to incentives set by legislation? Don't we need more legislation to make unsustainable consumption, such as SUVs, large homes, uh, more expensive? So that's basically a question, should we uh, make SUVs and large homes more expensive? And then there's another question by Mr. Anonymous, which is about um, the EU's biggest budget item, the common agricultural policy, throws money at land, uh, but not jobs uh, and the environment. Should we not fundamentally change the CAP uh, policy? Um, how can this be made p uh, compatible with the Green Deal? So one on the forbidding unsustainable consumption or making it more expensive, the other one on the CAP, please. Well, as we discussed before, um, this is essentially an issue of distribution or redistribution. And redistribution is incentivized by fiscal measures. And uh, taxing what pollutes more uh, uh, and taxing labor less is, I think, the way forward. Um, and I think this, this will apply to cars, it will apply uh, to homes, it will apply to other con consumption patterns, um, uh, big and small. So I do believe that if you really want this redistribution to work in a fair way, you need to use the taxation system. And by the way, uh, you will allow me this political remark. Anybody who still today believes in trickle-down economics needs to wake up and smell the coffee. It doesn't work. And it's about time we understood that by providing tax relief for the richest people uh, on earth, you do not provide for a better society. I think this is highly urgent to be understood everywhere. 
Um, now, on, on, this, on the second, uh, uh, second uh, uh, point, uh, the common agricultural policy. The farm to fork strategy is a way to reform the common agricultural policy, to make people far more aware of uh, uh, what they eat and uh, of how their consumption patterns influence uh, the agricultural world. I, I do believe, you know, and the pandemic, I think, should have shown this. I do believe there is a strong willingness uh, uh, in, in our population to make sure what you eat is healthy, that, what you, that you know what you eat, that you know where it comes from. I think this is a huge opportunity uh, for farming uh, in Europe. But I also believe we still need to continue reforming the common agriculture policy. I absolutely accept the point that too much of the money goes to the landowners and not to the people who work on the land. And the Commission has been, been, been arguing for, for a shift in what we call the first pillar in our agriculture policy in this area, but member states are still very reluctant to make this happen. So much to my regret, still now, if you own a lot of land, even if you don't live on it, even if you don't work on it, uh, you can get a, a lot of revenue from the common agriculture policy, whereas people who farm the land sometimes do not get the support. And I really think there should be a political momentum to change this, because without the farming community, we cannot come out of this crisis. And by the way, farming and rural areas, they can create a level of carbon sink that is incredible, and that could really help us. You know, you could have you, negative emissions if you have, if you, if you follow the Commission's plans, and we plant three billion trees in Europe, and we make forestry and the management of forestry something that is interesting for the rural areas. If we green our cities, if we green our rural areas, you know, we can create also a sustainable uh, future for for rural communities, and at the same time, mm. hugely uh, uh, decrease emissions and create carbon sink. Vice President, may, may I dwell a little bit on this issue of redistribution, which is, I think, you, you've been very clear in your presentation and throughout all your comments about the importance of redistribution. I think that you, the Commission has made also a very big deal with the Just Transition Fund. The distribution is crucial in, in determining the success of the Green Deal. And it, it relates to, to, a, to a bigger issue, the issue of inequality. And, and I, I am convinced that uh, throughout the three days here at, at Bruegel, the issue of inequality and distribution will be one that we will hammer on uh, because we believe it's a, it's a very important one. But is it really about just the tax incentives? Is it really just about taking a pie and just cutting it differently? Um, you know, if you're interested in sustainable outcomes, which of course is all what the Green Deal is about, is it not just about a lot much earlier where you have to think about changing the modus operandi. It's not just about the cake. It's about how we produce value added and how we distribute it. The outcome of this production of value added, how we distribute it. You know, how do you go about changing actually whole thinking of the way that we produce economic value in order to satisfy the well, issue of distribution? Well, yes, and of course this, this is already happening across the board in, in parts of our economy. Mm. Um, uh, when we came out, uh, the Commission, a couple of years ago, uh, Katainen and myself, with the first Circular Economy Action Plan, it looked like something for the initiated, something for a hmm. niche, etc. Now, with the second uh, Circular Economy Action Plan, this has become sort of already the mainstay in, in, in economic thinking. So, uh, already in, in the largest part of our economy, sustainability has become you know, one of the biggest priorities. And also, reducing dependency on primary resources, avoiding throwing things away, uh, sure. uh, making repairability uh, more uh, interesting, looking at different ways. You know, if I look at my, my kids, for instance, my oldest kids, uh, you know, for my dad, uh, for my grandparents, having a car was impossible. For my dad, the measure of his success was the fact that he could own a car. That was sort of the biggest success in his life. He was a car owner. Uh, for me, it's already, I like to have a car, etc. I was brought up by my dad, so it was... All, but if I look at my kids, they want transportation. They want to be taken from one place to the other. And, and they understand that having a car that sits there 22 hours a day is, might, might not be the best possible investment, neither from an economic perspective nor from an environmental perspective. So attitudes are changing in sure. this. But, 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 in the last 20 years... You know, it has become more and more difficult to have a good life just based on the hours you work. It has become more and more difficult for one-income households to s maintain the same standards they were used to in the 70s and the 60s. It has become much easier to make an enormous amount of money with capital 
So I think there is also a, 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 a distortion in the relationship between labor and capital in terms of how you can create well-being in society. So we have a fundamental problem in our economic structure that rewards capital relatively too well as compared to, to labor, as compared also to being environmentally sustainable. And mm -hmm. that is because the, sh the scale of our economy has gone way beyond the scale of the nation state. And the nation state traditionally, since uh, the welfare state came into being, was the controller of how we redistribute. And the nation state can no longer do this because the economy has gone beyond that. Mm. And you can take capital anywhere you like, etc. So you need international structures to do that, starting with Europe. And Europe has to help the member states to create fairer redistribution within the societies. And it's not just about the climate crisis. It's not just about sustainability. It's about something that has been going in the wrong direction for at least 20 years and needs to be corrected. So I promised to uh, to ask some questions that are very popular. So so le yeah, <laughs> let, me, let me get you uh, the top question, which uh, I'm actually surprised that it's on the top, but but still it's there. So so let me ask it to you by Mr. Anonymous or Mrs. Anonymous. What is, in your opinion, the role of natural gas and renewable gases in supporting a fair energy transition, especially in regions highly dependent on coal? Well, let's be <laughs> very clear. If you move from coal to natural gas, you already reduce uh, carbon emissions substantially. So uh, it is a good contribution. But, uh, and I believe it is also in a transitional phase, a necessary contribution, natural gas, but not in the end phase. I think at the, at, at the end of the day, if we can find ways to decarbonize natural gas through CCS, then, of course, it becomes already more interesting. But ideally, I would just refrain from any sort of uh, 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 resource that we have to take out of the ground and that is uh, uh, limited in, in, its, in its use. But, you know, take a country like Poland, for instance, where now 80% of the energy comes out of coal. If you would shift that already to natural gas, you would improve livability in Polish cities in an incredible way because their main concern is poor air quality everywhere. And in Europe, 400,000 people a year die prematurely because of bad air quality. Already moving from coal to natural gas would be an improvement. And by the way, the natural gas uh, and its infrastructure can also help, if we do it in the right way, to transit to hydrogen because the infrastructure you need for natural gas with limited adaptations can then later be used for sustainable forms of gas such as hydrogen and other uh, derivatives uh, of hydrogen. Um, there is no doubt that we have a mammoth task ahead of us and you as the first line of defense uh, has a, a, very big, a, very job, uh, a very big task ahead of you. If you were to pick one policy to advance the cause, what would that be? That's a fantastic question. I mean, you could pick more, but I think I, I would like to get a sense of priorities. I, I think, as far as I'm concerned, my biggest worry is that people will say, yeah, you're right in the long run, but what does that mean for me tomorrow and the day after tomorrow? So if I can combine the two, the long run with immediate results, I end up with a renovation wave. If we can create a renovation wave in Europe that hmm. is adapting the built environment, and yes. building uh, in a sustainable way, okay. you immediately create jobs, jobs that cannot be delocalized, jobs across the spectrum, because you okay. would involve uh, um, sure. uh, local SMEs, but also multinationals who produce the uh, solar panels or the modern glass, etc. But it has to be put together in a place in Europe. Mm -hmm. So you immediately create jobs. You immediately create um, uh, an incentive for people to renovate the housing. You then also create a positive for them because their energy bill will go down, the, the, the value of their housing will go up. So you have hmm. all sorts of short-term uh, benefits with a long-term goal of reducing the emissions of a, of a housing and a built environment. So if you, if you ask me to give you one priority, that would be my priority. Well, thank you very much. That's very clear. <laughs>
Indeed, renovation is a big, a big topic and a very immediate topic. Immediate um, topic. Let me perhaps ask one, uh, one more question really here from the audience, which is um, actually by, by my colleague, uh, Simone Tagliapieta, who is who's working at Bruegel on, on green issues. He is asking the following question. To be socially supported, the Green Deal must turn decarbonization into an industrial opportunity. How can we develop a workable green industrial policy? Well, small question. Yeah, uh, let, let me small just question. let me it's just try and and, and and just make it concrete uh, in my in my answer. Look at European steel industry today, um, struggling because of global competition, highly polluting, even though compared to the rest of the world it's much better, but still certainly not climate neutral yet. Imagine we could transform that industry within five to ten years into an industry that uses hydrogen as its energy source. We would have green steel. And if you then would say, in Europe, we only accept green steel, and if you want to be on our market, you have to produce green steel, or you will have to pay a premium for the carbon footprint of the steel you produce. We can do this. Europe can do this. So I give you one example of where we could transform an industry that looks like almost untransformable right. into a sustainable future. And this will create jobs across Europe. This will create also the feeling that there is something like green steel. This would enormously help our car industry and other parts of our, our, our industry. And this, I believe, can be done with between five and ten years. Only to bridge these five and ten years, we will have to support the steel industry to get there. Well, uh, Vice President, um, there are 39 or even 40 questions. Um, we've <laughs> asked you, I think, a very large number of questions, but we couldn't ask you all 40 of those questions because time is really running out. We've been uh, here quizzing you now for more than half an hour. Um, it's been fantastic uh, to discuss with you. It's a, it's a huge topic. Um, it's a topic that I think concerns us all, where I think we all... Uh, firmly, I think, really, I think most citizens, as you say, really understand that climate change is a huge issue. They're just worried about the way we do it. Uh, you know, is it going to affect my job? Will I survive? Uh, will I have a future? But they understand that this is a huge issue. I'm quite convinced of this. And so, so really, I, I think your job is is a huge job, uh, but, but and a very, very important job, but a very difficult job also, and we wish you all the luck with that job. Well, thank you, but I will need your help, and also the help of the, of the audience following us, because I no longer worry about the climate deniers. Uh, I mean, they have run out of steam, and, and if they continue denying the climate crisis, uh, I can't help them. Uh, but I do worry about climate desperation, about more and more people thinking, well, it's all lost anyway. Um, so why bother? Why do mm. all this if it's all lost anyway? And we really need to convince people that we can fix this. We have the technology. We have the human capital. We even have the money if we want. What we need is to get it organized. The deficit here is a political deficit. It's not a financial deficit, not a technological deficit. It's a political deficit. And the political deficit has become worse because of because of people being disappointed, because of the inequalities in our society, because of the temptation of vibrant nationalism that has come up. But if we overcome the political deficit, I'm sure we can fix this. Mr. Vice President, uh, please uh, can I ask our audience to give us a virtual applause. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, being with us. It's been a great debate. Thank you. It was you. my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.